even if it wasn't something that you had in mind before. So, um, let me say just for purpose of introduction, my name is Moshe Levin. I was born in New York uh, to a, 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 lit, a pure Litvak father who was born and raised in Yonaba and, uh, and came to, and left uh, in the 1920s. And to, to a mother whose father came from Surrey in Lithuania. And, uh, and I grew up in a community post-Holocaust, but immediately after the Holocaust, in the 1950s, that was regarded as a Litvak community. Uh, whether they were all Litvaks or not, it's uh, beyond, the, beyond the point, because there were what people we called Galiziana and Polish, etc. But everybody wanted to think of themselves as a Litvak because it was a symbol of intellect and learning <laughs> and study. Um, and uh, I grew up in a very orthodox environment, um, not Hasidic, no beards and payers, etc., but, uh, but very observant of Jewish practice, Jewish law, and so on, but in an orthodox framework, meaning it was not open to um, total critical thinking. There were axiomatic principles which we were expected to accept and to believe. And um, um, my goal in growing up was to be a painter, an artist. Wow. <laughs> and um, a, a strange circumstance occurred when I was around 12 years old, when I was learning about the Holocaust, etc. And I was told that the field of commercial art in the United States was anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. And it was true. I didn't know what commercial art was, but I knew what anti-Semitism was because we saw pictures of my father's brothers and their wives and their children and I, the children like me, my cousin, and I was told that they were all murdered, they were all perished in death camps and shooting in the forests, etc. So I knew enough about anti-Semitism that if someone told me that my chosen profession was anti-Semitic, get out of there. And I had no idea what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I went all the way through college, didn't know what I wanted, and I was uh, invited to be, um, because of my background, to help a small group of people that was starting a new synagogue uh, and I had just gotten married, so uh, I was living in that neighborhood, and they asked my help to help them get started. They couldn't afford a rabbi, it was just a small group of people. And they rented a storefront. It wasn't it was small, it was much smaller than the library for sure. And I enjoyed it very much, and the next thing I know I was in rabbinical school, and uh, what is it now, 54 years later, uh, I'm still a rabbi. <laughs> and uh, I've uh, officially retired, but um, uh, what has become really important to me is to uh, teach, lecture, open discussion, and also learn about great Jewish artists. Um, I, uh, earlier today, I did a foolish thing. His sons had a little scooter outside <laughs> that's built for children, not the fancy ones they have on the street that have brakes. This was just a scooter. And like a fool, I got on the scooter and I went down the hill and I said, this is wonderful. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, it came to the bottom of the hill. I didn't know, there's no way, to, how do I stop? <laughs> Upside down, I turned over and I got a little bruise here, but I got a bigger bruise over here. Ooh. In here, it hurts me a lot. And then your hand. So, yes. this is very good for me. Because when <laughs> I'm engaged in 
study. <laughs> I don't feel the pain. <laughs> if we didn't gather tonight, I'd just be sitting there worrying. So, uh, hurting. So I'm glad we have the opportunity for this. <laughs> well. The second question is, what really should we study? I uh, announced a, a topic, uh, and Jovanus very correctly says, we should start with that, let's cover that. If anybody came because of that, they have a right to hear about that. And I'm prepared to share with you uh, the essence of, of my talk, which is the best, which is, which is the, uh, well, I'm going to even give it a little introduction. I, this afternoon I took out one of the books that used to be my library. Many of the books here were my library over the 50 years that I was a rabbi. And I donated them to the Vilnius Jewish Public Library. No, they, because they my, are in the boxes because they are being processed and cataloged in the National Library. Usually all those shelves are filled up with his mm -hmm. with Your books, books yeah. donated by Moshe. And so I went to visit my books, I put one out, and I uh, was reading an introduction to the great Jewish philosophers of the 20th century. And the, the introduction written by the scholar who collected this is very, very, uh, very, really had a great understanding, makes the point that in every century, and in reality almost every generation, Jewish philosophers responded to the intellectual or philosophical needs of their generation. So he goes back to the issue of Philo with the Greeks and, and Jews living in Alexandria, which was the Greek city in Europe, uh, very heavily populated with Jews. And he goes back to that period and he says, the need at that time was to combat mm -hmm. the competing philosophy of Hellenistic Greek culture that looked down upon Jews as being old-fashioned or whatever, etc. And the writings of philosophers were, from, were responding to the concerns of Jews then. And he goes and traces it all the way up to the 20th century. He goes through the early Middle Ages, he goes through the later Middle Ages, he goes through the Age of Enlightenment, and I realize that as an introduction, his point is that every generation, and certainly every century, follow, uh, faces new challenges as to what it means to be a Jew. And why be a Jew? He stops at the end of the 20th century. He stopped. Where the major concern was dealing with the, uh, the conflict between religion and secularism, or uh, uh, science. And, and it shows that the philosophers of the 20th century worked very hard to explain Judaism in very rational terms. What he does not do, because it was published mm -hmm. over 20 years ago, what he does not do is, what's the challenge in the 21st century to being Jewish? What does it mean to be Jewish? What are the conflicts, etc.? And I have to answer that question on my own, because I am a Jew from the 21st century. So, close the book. <laughs> And I'll tell you what I think the challenge is now. The challenge now for the Jewish community is what is the relationship between the Jews living in Israel, Israelis, mm -hmm. and Jews living in the Western world in the diaspora? What is their relationship to each other? Before the Holocaust, the center of Jewish life was not in Israel or in the United States. It was in Europe. Yeah. After the Holocaust, Europe went up in smoke, and there was no center of Jewish life. And so, two communities, Persian, grew up. They, they, 
they came of age quickly. The Jews in Israel and the Jews in the United States, Canada, England, parts of South America, and some other places in Europe. In the early portion of this period, they got along famously well. Yeah. Come on, come on. <laughs> they, they got along famously well. The greatest need of the Jews of Israel was to build a country from scratch from the desert, from the sands. Tel Aviv didn't exist. It was all beach. And it was an extension of Yafo, an old ancient city that was primarily Arab. And they had a responsibility to start making a home for the Jewish people because the Holocaust came because there was no place that was safe for Jews. Putting it simply, there was no other place, not even the United States, which wouldn't let people in right during the Holocaust. In my congregation, I had a man who was one of the 1,000 children the United States allowed in during the Holocaust. Mm. Imagine the United States of America, which at the time had almost 300 million people, only made took a place for 1,000 children. He was on the Kinder transport. Germany, England, and then he was one of the lucky ones. It's an amazing thing. So because Jews didn't feel safe anywhere, there had to be a state of Israel, or they believed that to be a state of Israel. And the Jews in Israel, their job was to build that state with houses and shops and commerce and schools and a health system and colleges and universities and police and military. The job of the diaspora community, what was the job of the diaspora community? To raise money <laughs> to pay the bill because in the diaspora, why were they in the United States and Canada and in Buenos Aires and places like that? Because there were oppor economic opportunities. It wasn't that they wanted to live amongst the Christians in the United States or the Eskimos in Canada or the, or, or the uh, uh, cowboys in, 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 in Argentina. They went there because there were opportunities economically. So here yeah, they had money, here they had needs, and so, that was the relationship. Well, it's now 75 years since the birth of the State of Israel. And basically for the last 50, <laughs> Israel has actually been making major gains. And now when you go to Israel, it's unbelievable. Tel Aviv is vying with New York, Singapore, and Paris as the most expensive cities in the world. It's amazing. Israel exceeded the gross, the, the, um, not the gross national product, but the, the uh, I don't know what the term is for the, the average income in, of, a, of, of citizens in the community or residents in the community. It exceeded England about, I think, at least 12 years ago, maybe longer than that. It, it's a leader in science and technology, in computer chips, not just diamonds. They've been exporting flowers to Holland. They, um, they, they, uh, they're, they're, they're the, the first, I believe, in generic drugs, tremendous amount of medical research, and uh, uh, um, 
artificial intelligence. They've got companies now that are being bought by, by uh, companies in the United States. But now, Israeli companies are buying some of the companies in the United States. It's absolutely amazing. See what happens when there's no artificial intelligence? <laughs> <laughs> they don't know if somebody... They, they thought that uh, uh, nobody's here and the lights went off. Okay, so... No, no, it's not me. <laughs> I was thinking that uh, Israel is the most expensive country in the world because it's the uh, it's level of the life. It's the level of the life. Sure. Sure. Okay. The level of the life, I think, is uh, it's not like... Um, uh, people living not so so my the salary is not so big and of course it's a lot of money going to military mm -hmm. and uh, it's not uh, expensive not because it's uh, it's very good I think it's not very good uh, position in Israel in the world it's expensive because I lived in Israel my son lived in Israel and now it's not so easy to mm -hmm. to for you know it's uh, how to say it if you if you say that it's plus I think it's not very big plus. It's because I, I don't hear, I read lips, and it's far away, somebody has to tell me... What, it's not such a good life in Israel. What companies? He's saying it's not such a good, easy life in Israel, in his experience. Life in Israel is not so good. No, I mean... So I mean not so easy. I mean, I mean, it's most expensive. It's, yeah. Israel is not the most expensive country in the world. Oh, yeah. But it's not so good for Israel people. Yeah. Uh, it's not so good for the people. Very good. That's an excellent point, and that's going to be something of what I'm going to be talking about. So let's keep that in mind, that Israel is a tremendous success in the field of, as a country, as a nation. It's called the startup nation. But let's keep in mind that there are issues of poverty in Israel, tremendous gap in income growing, and even young professionals are finding it impossible to have the money to be able to buy an apartment, let alone nobody thinks about a house. So, uh, yes, it's one thing when you go to a restaurant and you have to pay $50 a person for dinner, that's making it expensive and more if you want to have wine, but it's something else that people can't afford to go to those restaurants. So, your point is well taken. I'm going to deal with that. But the reality is, the one thing that Israel doesn't seem to need anymore from the Jews in Western democracies is charity, yeah, Israel bonds, donations, support. Mr. and Mrs. Jacob Goldstein from Baltimore, Maryland will donate this, this wing to the new library, to the hospital, etc. Today, if Mr. and Mrs. Goldberg say, we want you to make uh, uh, research in the hospital for a rare disease that our son died from, the hospital may say, Mr. Goldberg, we have other needs and we would like to accept your gift but you cannot tell us what to do. We will spend it the way we think. And because if we don't get it from you, we'll get it from somebody else even right here in this country. Meaning, the only point I'm making is that what the Jews of Israel depended upon from the Jews of the diaspora has shrunk in its needs. For a while, it was not just money, but more important than that, it was diplomatic influence. Mm -hmm. It was, Connection. we in Israel need you Jews in the United States and in Canada and in, even in, 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 in Central America, etc. with your remnants. We need your support <laughs> in the Parliament or the Congress or the UN to make sure we have enough money for defense to uh, support us in our research, etc. Even now, there are voices in Israel that are saying, we don't need you American Jews to try to influence your Congress people to support us. Because 
we can get along without the support of the United States. Now, I'm not going to argue whether that's true or not. Very doubtful. But when you hear that kind of a statement coming from leaders in the government that have become a part of that right wing under Benjamin Netanyahu, you realize that there is a feeling in Israel of less need for dependence from Jews of the diaspora. Let's go to the other side. What did the Jews of the diaspora need? Well, they needed a sense of pride in being Jewish. Because in the countries they were living in, predominantly Christian countries, I'm not talking about uh, Muslim countries. In the Christian countries, they were made to feel inferior. They didn't necessarily see themselves as inferior, generally not. But they were regarded as inferior. A high percentage of Americans, <laughs> when polled, said they don't want to live next to a Jew. They did not want Jewish neighbors. They didn't want their children marrying Jews. They didn't believe uh, it was a good idea to hire a Jewish person. There was, we just learned recently that Stanford University, 25 and 40 and 30 and 40 years ago, had a quota of Jews. Now, of course, they're apologizing, and I think the president of Stanford University is Jewish. But if we go back 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we'll see that the Jews in the diaspora, at least that diaspora, and the same is true in England, South Africa, um, uh, and parts of South America, etc., they were treated as inferior. It was part of the anti Semitism that came from whatever sources anti-Semitism comes from. So what the Jews and the diaspora needed was a sense of pride. And Israel gave them that pride. The big wake-up came in June 1967 with the Six-Day War. And here, this little tiny army of Israel was facing five Arab countries that swore we're going to put you into the sea and in six days it was those Arab armies that were suing for a ceasefire. Israel was on its way to Damascus, Syria. Syria on its way. It made it all to the, as far as Cairo across the Suez Canal. Six days. How? Smart. We're not going to attack the Egyptian army, uh, air force directly. They'll have radar that'll shoot us down. We're going to go around Egypt and come in from the back. And we're going to fire on that air force that's still on the ground where they're trained to, to expect us from, from, the, from the east. We're going to attack from the west. And they wiped out the, the Egyptian air force before it ever got off the ground. The horror was the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Egyptian soldiers who, who were perished in the desert because they were in tanks that were going the wrong way. And they even outsmarted the Syrians from the Golan Heights with the, 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 spy, the spy Eli Cohen who advised them. He was a, a, an Israeli spy. And he, in Syria, was turned to for advice for warfare by the Syrian government, and he came to the Golan Heights and he says, you know, you've got all of your soldiers lined up in these bunkers. It's so hot. You should plant palm trees over the bunkers for the shade. And then he gave the information to the Israeli intelligence, and when they were fighting the war, they knew exactly where the bunkers were because they were beneath palm trees. So they astounded the world with the six-day victory, and Jews became very, very proud. Mm -hmm. I remember when I went into the Air Force during the war in Vietnam, 
how the American Air Force pilots, when they learned that I was Jewish, they didn't say, oh, I don't want to live near you. They said to me, your boys are great. <laughs> they were talking about the Israeli Air Force. So it gave a sense of pride. Not just that, but Israel seemed to exemplify itself about caring for all of its citizens. Before there was the big income gap, Israel was a socialist country. It had the kibbutz system. It had universal health care, virtually universal education. University education was very uh, uh, nominal in cost and there were always scholarships, etc. And people from all walks of life could easily get a quality education. So there was a tremendous, tremendous sense of pride in Israel. And it made American Jews, Canadian Jews, British Jews, South African Jews, very proud. What happened since then? Things change drastically. Things change drastically. And we now come to where we are virtually today, with the big protest demonstrations in Israel, where the government has moved to the right wing and attempted to actually um, uh, uh, propose a limitation of the Supreme Court and the judicial system. And ultra-Orthodox, that used to be a tolerated minority, has now become very, very strong and very powerful in the government. They have 20% of the population and well over 30% of the small children in the early elementary education, first, second, third grades. They're well over 30%, which means, and they get married at earlier ages, and their birth rate is five, six times that of a secular Israeli. So now they realize they have tremendous power in the government. They're able to hold the, 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 the government by the neck and demand money for their schools and their programs, etc. Even though they're limiting education, their, their children in the ultra-Orthodox communities are not learning math, science, English, of the languages, they're studying ancient Hebrew texts, mm -hmm. and they're not serving in the military, and their women don't get much of an education, and so they're and they're building more and more control. So there's tremendous conflict within Israel in that level. On the across the ocean, in the Western countries. The Jews no longer the Jews living there no longer have a need for the pride because they found that they're accepted. President Clinton and his uh, and his wife Hillary have a daughter who's married to a Russian-born Jewish guy, and they get their picture on Time magazine for the wedding. He's wearing a talit. President Trump has a daughter who married an Orthodox guy and she converted. Uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is a, is a big name in the field of, of, of uh, 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 social media. And uh, Steven Spielberg in films. And there are many, 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 many Jews who have made it into the mainstream and are symbols of success. So Jews in these countries are no longer dependent upon Israel for pride. In fact, my guess is the same thing has spilled over here, in both the countries and in Europe. Why? Zelensky. Yes. Is it, is it a secret that Zelensky is a Jew? No. no but no. he's in reality the most popular leader in the world today. Yeah. Not the strongest. Still, hmm. Biden is still sitting in the White House. But in terms of a popularity contest, of, of respect or of admiration, etc., this Jewish comedian became the president and all, at the most, <laughs> biggest crisis, a crisis that the United States and England and France, etc., none of them know how to handle. 
These are the countries that made peace with Hitler. Not Zelensky, not Ukraine. So that we don't, they don't need Israel for their sense of pride. So their reasons, their dependent upon each other, their dependency upon each other has moved away. Where are they now? I said the biggest question for 21st century Jews is what is our relationship between the state of Israel and the diaspora? And it's moving away from each other. Not just that it stopped moving away from each other. Why? I didn't see this uh, in official documents, but somebody that I trust very, very much with his knowledge, high up in the Israeli educational system, who works with groups of youth in Israel, with teachers, training and training programs, and with um, uh, diaspora Jews coming to visit Israel, teenagers, etc. He said that there was a poll taken amongst these young people and they were asked this question, if you had to choose one or the other in a serious question, which one would you choose? If the decision is made where people will be divided between perpetrators of horror, of genocide, of murder, and victims of genocide, of horror, of murder. You cannot choose both. You cannot choose none. You can't walk away. You have to choose one side or the other. Would you choose to be a perpetrator or would you choose to be a victim? My contact told me that all of the Israeli youth in that poll chose one, the same answer, and all of the American youth chose the other answer. No exceptions. Mm -hmm. Which were the, what were they? What were those? What were the choices? What did the Israeli youth say and answer the question, if you had to be either a perpetrator or a victim, which would you be? And what did the American youth answer? My the guess. Israeli youth, you have any ideas? Uh, my guess would be that the Americans uh, have chosen to be uh, a victim. Correct. Yeah. The American oh. Jews chose not that they want to be, but if you, I would rather be a victim than a perpetrator. Yeah. And the Israelis, the and the Israelis will be opposite. Yeah. I don't want to be a persecutor, a, prosec a, a persecutor, but if I have to choose, I'm not going to be a victim. Why was there that difference? That's such a a stark difference. Why is there that difference? And I don't know if that, what I was told, is flawless, correct. I didn't see the statistics. But <clears throat> I understood where it was coming from. Why do the Israeli youth say, if I had to choose, I will not be a victim. If I have to, I'll be a persecutor, but I'm not going to be a victim. Why? Because, well, the Israel was... Uh, created to be safe from being a victim. Israel was created to be safe from being a victim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it was first founded and the truth of the Holocaust came out, Israelis were ashamed of Holocaust victims. Okay. The word was they went to their they went to their slaughter like sheep. They looked down on them. 
when survivors will sing, remember my tata, my mama, my uh, son, my daughter, my children, etc. Remember them? Israelis close their ears. Why did you stay in Germany? Why did you stay in Poland? Why did you get out? Why did you fight back? We will, we Israelis will not be victims. Now, Israel's war of independence is way in the past. But what's been going on since then? They're constantly facing terrorism from, from uh, Palestinians. And I'm not arguing that the Palestinians are right or wrong or anything like that. The reality is that the average Israeli person, young or old, is constantly hearing about the danger of the enemy. That we have to, how do we protect ourselves? We have to have a very strong army, a strong police force, strong border control, and when you catch a kid with a knife, Break his arms. When you catch somebody firing a gun, kill him first. Don't ask questions. When you see a woman who looks pregnant, but then you touch her, she may have a bomb. Eliminate her. No mercy. And it's constantly, constantly been going on now for 40 years. Constantly that we are besieged. And we are besieged by our, everybody around us. The only ones who don't want to kill us are the fish in the Mediterranean Sea. Because every other border is our enemy. So there is the mentality of a country that was born in the Holocaust, that I don't know the percentage, but a high percentage of its, of its citizens in 1950s were Holocaust survivors. They have a March of the Living every year, taking every Israeli youth to, to Auschwitz. This is what happens when you are a victim. Now, they never said it's good to be the persecutor, but don't be a victim. Let's go to the Diaspora Jews. And they're in Europe, they're in the United States, they're in South America. Things are different there. There isn't the feeling that being Jewish is being a victim or potential victim. Anti-Semitism with all of the incidents of the far right wing and, and, uh, and other incidents that have gone on, shootings in synagogues, etc., all to be taken seriously. But there is not the feeling of the United States and Canada and England in Caracas or in, or in Buenos Aires, there is not the feeling that you're unsafe by being a Jew. <clears throat> what has happened is that Jews in the diaspora have acculturated into the Judeo-Christian values of concern for the underdog, for the underprivileged. When you reach the point where you have the money it takes to go to a fancy restaurant, to buy a nice car, to go on a vacation, etc., you make two choices. Am I going to continue to feed myself alone, or am I going to share? Am I going to amass as many toys as I can, or am I going to help out the people who don't have enough to eat? And the Judeo-Christian culture of Western civilization is help those who have less than you do. So they became active in the civil rights movement. Very, very active. Way higher than their percentage of the population. They became active in charities. First they were building hospitals so Jewish doctors would have a place to practice. After that, they you see the Jewish names as donors in hospitals and concert halls and operas because help out other people. If you want to get money from a museum from a Jew in the United States, what you have to say is not we want to acquire 
fantastic works of art. You have to say to them, we want to make it possible for underprivileged teenagers from the black ghettos and the Latino community, we want to make it possible for them to come free. So we need the money that once a month we have a free day for people to come where they pay nothing. That's how you get money from a Jew. Now you've got the Palestinian question. <laughs> In Israel, the Palestinians are a hated enemy because they want to kill us. In Western civilization, the Palestinians are that poor, uh, uh, underprivileged, oppressed people who live under Israeli occupation. Whoa. The communities are moving apart. Mm -hmm. And their, the, their separation is growing. It was estimated, and these are factual uh, polls, that well over 70% of the American Jewish community mm -hmm. is opposed to the Netanyahu government. At the same time, 67% voted for Netanyahu in Israel. They're going in different directions. When the protest demonstrations started in Israel, people against the attempts of the right wing to, to limit the Supreme Court and judicial system, hordes of American Jews started to join that protest movement in Los Angeles and New York and Philadelphia and Baltimore and San Francisco, etc. And they came wrapped in Israeli flags. We're going in different directions. So, I now want to come to a conclusion. Because my conclusion, <laughs> I think, is, is a statement about conflict resolution. The story is told of the rabbi who was approached by two people who were in a very, very angry dispute with each other. And at first the rabbi listens to one of them. He hears a story. And he says, you're right. The fellow leaves, the other fellow comes in, he tells his side of the story. And the rabbi says to him, you're right. Meanwhile, the rabbi's wife is in the next room. She overhears the whole thing. She says to her husband, these two men are diametrically opposed to each other. How can you say you're right and you're right? It doesn't make sense. And the rabbi says to her, you're right too. <laughs> What's the point of that story? <laughs> the point of that story is, in a conflict, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, there is justification on both sides. Democrats in the United States are still trying to figure out how did Donald Trump win the 2016 election? Doesn't make sense. He got elected by a large contingent that said we believe in family values and he is proven again and again, he's the worst example of family values. <laughs> his treatment of women, his attitude towards marriage, his disrespect for people, name calling, etc. Family values, but they voted for him. They voted for him, the working class voted for him, even though he does very little for uh, offering uh, he's opposed to universal education, universal theory, etc. Why? Because within those elements, there were what we would say in Yiddish is a, a justified taina, a justified positions that things were not perfect under the Democrats. 
that the Democrats seem to be more concerned with Iraqi and Afghanistan refugees than they were with the people living in Appalachia in, where there was a lot of poverty. They were, more, they were more concerned with the rights of black people uh, who were subjected to, to, to violence by the police than they were about, about the uh, uh, economic opportunities for those who didn't go to college, etc. So they were justified, they were justified reasons. <coughs> On the other hand, the other side also had justified reasons. It's unfair to have a system where people can lose their homes because they can't pay the medical bills. It's unfair when they went to pay, uh, people deserving of good education. All sorts. There is justification. You're right and you're right. The same is true here. Israel's concern about its safety and its need for, the be, for there to be a place of Jewish homeland is actually a justifiable argument. Yeah. But Jewish values, to keep Judaism alive, not merely to exist, but because we have a strong sense of the ethical imperative of being concerned for the poor and the oppressed and the downtrodden, fighting for the civil rights of all people, even if they say we're going to kill you. But you have to ask, why do they want, why are they sending their 14, 15 year old boys into the streets to, to throw stones at Israeli soldiers? Do mothers want their children to die? There's desperation here. So the reality is, you're right and you're right. Israel has to be a place of safety, but it also has to be a place of real values. American Jews should stand for real values, but they also have to be concerned about the safety and take seriously the threat from places like Iran and so on. And then I think is ultimately what we need. Is it going to happen? Prophecy was given over to fools after the temple was destroyed, so I don't know. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to stop and invite you to comment either to anything that I said or if you wish to discuss something that did not come up and you would like to hear a comment or share a comment, you're welcome to do that. Um, oh, is uh, works with the European Parliament, with the uh, with the EU, in uh, in an administrative capacity, and he said that one of the reasons I brought him here to the library tonight is the hope to be able to learn more about how the United States views the world situation, and I'm telling you, we hear many things in support of the Ukraine. And from a minority, we hear support of Russia, but usually uh, that's a little complicated. Yeah. But I am shocked and amazed to see wherever there is a flag of Lithuania, there's a flag of the Ukraine. Yeah. To go to the museum that Jovanos took us to today, that is holding on to art from Kiev and Lviv and displaying it, and they probably have more in the basement that they have on the walls, there's tremendous support for the Ukraine. Yeah. The United States has the power to swing that war. Yeah. Um, and it has its concerns about China and Russia and a Russian alliance with China. It deeply concerned, I think Biden's in a very difficult situation, but there's a lot to talk about there. And other questions come up, you're welcome. If, yeah. if I can ask you, um, what you said is very interesting because it comes to my mind about diaspora and the country. I lived abroad for the last 15 years in Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. So I was diaspora. Right. And now I'm trying to get my feet on the ground in Lithuania. It's my third week in Lithuania. <laughs> so I'm new. And I can tell you, it looks very nice, it looks wonderful life in Vilnius. 
but it's so expensive, I cannot afford to drive a nice car, I'm walking. I have a bus ticket, I cannot buy a car because my car is the, the ugliest one, the old car. I'm renting and um, I'm not complaining because I'm also renting a nice place. I would like to buy a flat, but I see that the success of Lithuania, especially Vilnius, has been rising as fast and let's say in Luxembourg the, the uh, every year economy grew maybe one or two percent per year and in Vilnius for the last 15-20 years it was five percent per year mm -hmm. and now Vilnius overtook I see that uh, it's more fancy restaurants in here if you have money you can have a better life in Vilnius than in Luxembourg. So my question is how to adapt? What is the, the best way to adapt? If, if I'm the, I was diaspora and now I want to go, go back to connect to my motherland. Mm. What is your tips and advices? Mm. From, <laughs> from looking, okay. looking back uh, in, your, in your country, Americans who live in America, how they adapt, how they start their business mm. because uh, what you mentioned is very true. In Tel Aviv, it's so expensive. Yeah. I think it's way cheaper to buy somewhere in uh, in Colorado apartment than in Tel Aviv. So, what is your suggestion? How can diaspora be integrated back to the motherland? Yeah, it's a very good question, and it's a question I'm sure that's being asked in many, many parts of the world. I myself am shocked when we travel to see countries. Where I would have come as with American with a dollar, everything was so inexpensive and not anymore. Um, I I don't know if this is going to be helpful, but I'll share with you two things that come to my mind. One is one is a, we have a, a former labor secretary by the name of Reich. A Jewish guy was the Secretary of Labor under Clinton, and, and it's continued to remain in the forefront of this field of labor. He wrote a book called Saving Capitalism. He believes in the capitalist system, or at least that there's no better alternative. But, he says, we cannot have unbridled capitalism. We cannot have an un unlimited uh, capitalism whereby you pay someone, it used to be a million dollars to dance for 30 seconds in a television commercial because they're famous. And meanwhile, there's somebody else who's working as a plumber or in a, for the city or something and barely has enough money to support the family. It's no longer a million dollars for the 30 second commercial. Now it's 30 million dollars. It's just gone completely haywire. Do you have the ice cream uh, uh, company Ben and Jerry's? You Not that here. here in Lithuania? Not no. here. Not here. There's an ice cream company in the United States that was started by two Jewish boys in Massachusetts, Ben and Jerry, and it was called Ben and Jerry's. They made a tremendous success. Yeah, I don't think their ice cream was really any better. They gave made a major success because they came up with unexpected names for the flavors. So, for cherry ice cream, they called it Cherry Garcia, <laughs> after Jerry Garcia, the, the, the guitarist. They came up with very funny names that people remembered, and really cute, and they took off. They had a rule in their company. No one, including themselves as the owners, could make more than 17 times the lowest paid person in the company. So if somebody made uh, $100 a day, they could make $1,700, but they couldn't make $1,800. And that's a pretty big gap, but it limits it. And Robert Reich, the former labor secretary, is trying to see, is there a way of, um, of somehow 
putting a cap on what people can earn through taxation or through other means, etc. There are great inequalities in wealth in the United States uh, that favor the rich. For example, you're talking about how much it costs you to rent an apartment. In the United States, if you buy an apartment, it costs less than if you rent it. Why? Yeah. Because the government allows you to deduct the interest on the mortgage from your taxes. So that's an example that favors people with money. Why don't they allow people who don't own, let them at least deduct their rent? No. So they keep low-income people down and people with income get more. So there are ways in which a government could start putting some sort of brakes on capitalism. We have a situation, I forgot, probably intentionally, <laughs> of this, uh, Bezos, I think it was. Yeah. Um, so much money. He built a yacht, an enormous yacht, custom made. When he finished the yacht, he had a girlfriend. The girlfriend wanted a helicopter for the yacht. The yacht did not have any place for the <coughs> So what do you do when you have a big yacht and a girlfriend and wants a helicopter? He built a second yacht to follow him that has a helicopter <laughs> pad. There's <coughs> an issue of when is enough enough? The second thing I have to say about it <coughs> is a really tough answer. But the only thing I can think of is we have to take a lesson from some of the most desperate immigrants in countries like the United States. Quite a number of years ago, I was walking through the main square in San Francisco where I live, and there was in a small corner a little triangle with two buildings met, and somehow somebody put up a little bit of a wall over here with the door, a little triangle this big. And the sign was uh, sandwiches or something. And I, I saw it, I walked in, and I always like talking to people, especially if they're different from me. And I found that it was a, a, a husband and wife from Cambodia. They were immigrants to the United States. And they somehow managed to start this little sandwich business. They worked seven days a week from morning till night. They did not have a good life. They did not have a nice car. They did not live in a nice place, etc. But every penny they had, you know where it went? for the children's education. I said to them, what do you children do? They had grown, by that time the children had grown up. What do you do? One was an engineer and one was a physician. So I think that there might be a lesson from the fact that We have, to not, we have to be willing to work harder than we should have to and compress our needs early on so that the, we can have that extra income that invests it. And now's not a good time, it looks to get into the stock market, but even if somebody bought a few shares here and there, somehow, Make your money work for you. In their case, it was their children. Those are the things that come to my mind. And I wish I had much better answers. Uh, I don't. I hear that complaint in San Francisco all the time because nobody can afford, their, for their own children, they can't afford a house in San Francisco. And what they're doing is they're moving, they're forced to move further away. Um, not a good system. <laughs> I don't know, it takes a lot of time, I do a lot of talking. It's okay. When you're having it's a, a, it's okay. you, 
to talk more than you listen. But I'm open at least for another one or two comments before we call it a night. I did my watch stopped to have one of those watches. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> five past seven. Five past seven. Okay, not too bad. Right? But if anybody wants to add something or else a closing statement, this would be like, the time. I would like to come back to your statement that Jews uh, started feeling safe in Europe. Uh, whereas I, I, though I don't have uh, figures, numbers, but there's a huge influx into, into uh, Israel from France after terror acts took place. Uh, and Jewish communities are really scared. The same in Berlin and in, in France. Oh. Yeah. So I think that Zilbanis is quite correct. And, and, the, and the opposite the, is also yeah, correct. The move, politically correct. <laughs> the move from France to Israel is very substantial. There are communities in Israel now where the signs are first in French and then Hebrew. <laughs> and everybody on the street speaks French. There were so many French Jews. Wow. Here's where I'll differentiate. The danger in France did not come from the French people. It came from Muslim people from Arab mm -hmm. countries and places connected to Arab countries. To, they came to France, and they brought with them, and they were low-income people. Without the kind of education to compete in the French society, without the French culture, without the, the French uh, uh, standard of living and expectations, and their lives are very poor, desperate. And when you have people collectively desperate, they, and they come to the conclusion that there's no way out of their ghetto. They turn to crime and violence and hatred. Barbara and I were in Berlin. It's got to be 10 years ago, maybe more. And we met with a woman who's an expert, uh, she was the head of the American Jewish Committee in Berlin, which served all of Europe. And we asked her about, like, what's life like in Germany, etc. And she said, we are facing a potential bomb. Because we have a lot of uh, people from Turkey who have immigrated here and other Muslim countries is coming, and the German people don't want to allow them to integrate. Hmm. German people don't want to live, they don't want them living near them, they don't want their kids in the same school, they, so they're in the same neighborhoods with their same people, in their own schools, hmm. and they're stuck there, inferior education, inferior living standards, etc. And the more inferior their living standards, the more the German people don't want to let them integrate. We are building in the potential explosion. There's going to be a time where they will explode outside of the ghetto and we'll see crime and etc. What I think was going on in France was not French anti-Semitism, but Muslim anti-Semitism or Arab anti-Semitism mm. that had a growing influence in France because they became a larger and larger group of the population. And a proof example is Sweden, Malmo Sweden. Malmo Sweden saved Jews during the Holocaust. It was a great place to be a Jew. I met Jews <laughs> who after the Holocaust went to Sweden and they didn't want to leave, they stayed there. All of a sudden, there were incidents in Malmo, Sweden. And then, when I traveled to Sweden with, with Leonid, we started to find out they feel very unsafe. All of a sudden, why? An influence of Muslims uh, from Arab countries had come to Malmo, not to uh, Stockholm, and not to um, where they make the Volvo, 
but to Malmo, probably because it's on the coast. And there, the Jews in Malmo began to, to, uh, to suffer uh, incidents. So, it is true, we are told, don't go with a kippah anywhere in Europe. Don't, don't wear a kippah in France, don't wear a kippah in England, don't wear a kippah in Belgium, don't wear a kippah in Italy, don't wear a kippah in the Czech Republic, don't wear a kippah in Lithuania, don't wear a kippah, don't walk around with the Star of David. You're inviting an anti-Semitic incident. But the fear is not from the, from the European people and the Czech people or the Lithuanian people. The fear is, is there some Palestinian sympathizer okay. who wants 15 oh. min minutes of fame and he's going to kill a Jew. But there are right-wing movements and yeah. parties in Europe as well as in America, which are also intensifying. Uh, yeah, I, I wish I had more intelligent things to say, because I would like to say that those right-wing groups are coming again from people with a poor education, uh, a diff more difficult life. But we're not seeing it. In the United States, we're finding that is anti-Semitism that was beneath the surface and not kosher, not acceptable, has become acceptable and vocal from people who are um, well-educated and wealthy. And many of the, of the analysts uh, in the United States blame Trump because he made it he normalized or legitimized hate speech. He didn't come out hating Jews, but he came out with hating Democrats, hating women, hating this. And he began to say things that in the past you may have thought, but you didn't articulate them. And he gave the microphone to right-wing extremist groups. And you can't really blame just Trump because it came out in Hungary, and it's come out in, um, in Italy. It's, uh, extremism is, is on the rise. And Austria. Austria, yeah. Uh, then, uh, if I'm not mistaken, <coughs> so you, you were mentioning that young kids in Israel are being taught to be very uh, protective, aggressively protective against possible acts of violence from the side of Palestinians. Kill yes. a boy with a, with, with a gun, uh, will slaughter a, a pregnant woman if you suspect her bearing explosives, uh, etc. But on the other hand, I hear that Palestinians upbring their kids in the very same way. Since he is four years old, he carries a, a AK machine gun and he is being prepared that the best thing in life he can do to kill a, a Jew. So, and, and, and Very so. good point. I hope everybody understands what Joe is saying. And I have, a very, I have an important response. How to break that circle? What? What is <coughs> at least an essential <coughs> element in the definition of racism? Whether it's anti-Semitism, anti-black people, anti-Latino, anti-Asian, anti-Chinese, etc. What makes a statement an anti-Semitic statement or a, a racist statement in another form <coughs> is when the person making the statement is not talking about an individual person, but they're talking about an entire population, an entire nation, an entire race, an entire people. It is true that Arab kids in many situations are brought up taught into... If there are 10 Israeli soldiers and 
your older brother is a martyr, kills four of them, how many they left? That's a math lesson. Mm -hmm. But the basic one saying as all the Israeli soldiers deserve to die, <coughs> all, all uh, Israeli Jews deserve to die, all black people should get out of here, all, they're, they're all, they're, they're all what we despise. It is true that there is that teaching going on both in the community. And every Israeli kid is, an, is raised to know that that's how they're teaching math. But it's also true that there are many, many, many Palestinians who want to make peace with Israel, or who are willing to say, we could live with the Jewish state next door, but not the Jewish state that cuts down our, our olive trees, or that brings bulldozers to, to the houses when there's, a, there's a, an incident of, uh, of terrorism, or who pushes a, a pregnant lady without thinking that she has uh, a bombs, etc. There are many, many, many Palestinians who want to live in peace with Israel. There are many organizations in Israel that have partnerships with this Palestinian, Palestinian organization and the government is making them illegal. I have a very close friend whose daughter was killed in a bombing in, Tel in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. She was 14 years old. His name is Rami el -Khanan. The girl's grandfather was a general hero in the Six Day War. Mati Peleg was his name. After their daughter was killed, he and his wife didn't want to live anymore. And it went on like that for several years. And at a certain point, he came to the conclusion that he can't live with the anger and the sadness and the hatred and the grief. He had to do something positive. And I don't know how it happened, but he made contact or was introduced to, to a Palestinian family who also lost a child in the conflict. And it turned out that there was a small little organization called Bereaved Parents in Hebrew. Palestinian and Israeli parents who have lost children in the conflict. They formed a group just to talk to each other and to hear each other's stories and to exchange their, their feelings of sadness and grief because their point was no one else knows what we feel but someone who experienced the same thing. His daughter, Smadar, was killed well over 20 years ago. Well over 20 years ago. His father-in-law, Mati Pellet, the, the general, became a leader in the peace movement, Shalom Akshav. Rami and his wife became very involved in these bereaved parents groups. And they began to have a memorial every year and gatherings, etc. And they now have a membership in the thousands. Doesn't mean there are a thousand families Believe it, but the number of people that are connected with them. The government of Israel is trying to shut them down. The government of Israel has been trying to declare peace groups that are supported by the New Israel Fund in the United States as a foreign entity that should not have rights to be able to practice in Israel. Instead of working towards more peace, the, the right-wing government in Israel seems to
believe that it benefits from keeping up the fear of terror. That when there is an act of terrorism, everybody mourns. Nobody wants to see somebody killed. But the right wing will say, this is going to give us reason to go out into another Arab village or to start another outpost or legalize another settlement. Why do that? Why do that? I'm speaking now, I suppose, as a left-winger, but I'm not an extreme left-winger. I do believe that Israel has a right to protect itself very strongly and that terrorists should not be given sweet treatment. But I believe that efforts have to made, be made to encourage and support an image of peace. My brother who lives in Israel, well, he is part of a group that will always say, oh, I have customers who are Arabs. I've been to Arab complaints. And I have a lot of history. But he also says, beneath the service, every one of them will pull out a knife and stab me if they had a chance to. That's not true. Are there some who would? Yes. But I think there are many more who wouldn't. And you can't categorize an entire people by saying they're all like that. Especially if, if you're not rewarding those who are announcing would risk their own lives and call for peace. So, anyway. you, you also, uh, as if we, we were having a talk, whether it's written in the announcement or not, that you will, finally you will say something about the essence of Judaism. Yeah. And in the context of this political yeah. conflict, until now... So I think I could have one sentence. In Israel, the essence of Judaism and the essence of the State of Israel is to protect the survival of the Jewish people. The key word is survival. We have to do what we need to do to keep the Jewish people alive. The State of Israel is a state for Jews so that Judaism and the Jewish people will survive. For the diaspora Jew, the state of Israel has a right to existence if it's going to reflect the values of Judaism. If it becomes an, a, a, an unethical country, then there is no justification for Israel. The justification for Israel is to be a light unto the nations, to prove that it's possible to have a government with a police force and judges and an army and still be ethical. Okay. That's so Jewish values over here, Jewish survival over there. Could you put uh, in one sentence and a half, or in two sentences and a half, the essence of Judaism in general? What does the essence of Judaism in general? And to see general? In general. In. 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 In, general. In. in general. In general. In general. Essence of Judaism in general. In general. What was it? Spell it. General. General? In general. In general, yes. The essence of Judaism in general is a balance between survival and value. That sounds too political. I, would, would you move towards a little bit to the religious aspect? What well, is of, of Judaism as a religion? And how Judaism as a religion? Yeah. And Judaism how the does it work? The purpose and the essence of Judaism as a religion is to continue to meet new needs as they arise with a response that is the finest in the, in the ethical and the spiritual domain of the Jewish heritage. In other words, the spiritual is the appreciation of wonder and awe in existence. This is what Heschel was teaching 
and Buba was teaching and others, that the essence of Judaism as a, in the spiritual domain is to constantly remind ourselves that each and every person is in a divine image and even every moment of life is a miracle. On the behavioral level, it is to treat every other person in the world with the realization that they too are a miracle and that they too are a reflection of the divine. Not just me, everybody else. And that's, and that I think is combining the, the, the values or the, the insights of the Jewish philosophers and the Jewish moralists. Okay, and uh, how uh, how that spiritual essence is implemented in Israel and diaspora, you leave for ourselves to think about, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. But I would say that our responsibility is to live our lives individually with those truths that I am a miracle of existence and I must stand in awe of my being. I must stand in awe of that being. The realization that I have done nothing to deserve being born and I must be eternally grateful for that, for, that, for this opportunity and it's not going to last forever. But Jews are so famous about uh, arguing and discussing with God. There are jokes that God, there are three of us, and, and we are voting against you. And, oh, just joking. Yeah. So, uh, actually, the debate goes back to biblical times. Mm -hmm. There's actually been in the Talmud, there was the question, is it better to have been born or not to have been born? Mm -hmm. And the rabbis debated. And they come out with a conclusion that I don't accept. Mm -hmm. The conclusion is, it was better to not to be born. Mm -hmm. But, since we didn't have that choice, we have to live a, a life of a, reaching for perfection. I don't think that it's better not to be born. <laughs> I consider myself incredibly, I mean, just, it's beyond my imagination, my comprehension that I exist. Mm -hmm. And the closer I get to the end of my life, the more in amazement I have, I am, that I exist. Because I realize that one day I won't exist. Maybe it depends upon uh, the circumstances you come from. It's so easy for Muslims to say that you go as Shahid because uh, you will deserve and have better life there. Here you have nothing, you are very poor, you are inferior. And when you die, you will have, well, so many innocent women and you will be in paradise and you have wine and, and everything. These good. are a mistaken translation because they call, they, they, they promise not a 40 virgin, but 40 figas. So it's it's a mistaken translation. <laughs> you know, the problem and the problem with that is that if someone says the spirit lives on forever, I can I can understand what they're talking about and maybe so. But the description of that life after death is a denial of death. It's like I will be rewarded with virgins. Why? My penis is going to be shriveled up into nothing. It's going to turn into <laughs> dust. Well, my, my lips to kiss won't be there anymore. My eyes to see the beauty. My hands to fundle the touch. I mean, it's, it's, it's a denial that I will die. If you tell me that there's a soul that lives on, okay. But then it can't live on loving chocolate ice cream. Mm -hmm. It can't live on wanting to have sex. Mm -hmm. It can't live on saying, what kind of pizza am I going to have today? Mm -hmm. Because that's a denial of death. Mm -hmm. 
And all the evidence is, when you die, there's no more pizza in your life. <laughs> I have a question. Um, what you said is very correct, and I do agree, uh, that life is a miracle. Yeah. Wonderful gift. It's better to be born. But, again, if we have this precious gift, why are we wasting? Why are we fight with each other? Why we we start the wars? Uh, why there's a war happening? Why why cannot we as a human race? There's a flaw. There's a, there's a something in our computer doesn't work. We can yeah. just enjoy, and there's enough place for everyone. Yeah. If we if we if we respect, of course, each other. Yeah. When I was younger, I used to have an answer to that question. I don't have an answer anymore. When I was younger, I used to think that evil is not something in and of itself. It's the absence of good. Like, what is cold? Is there such a thing as cold? No. What there is is an absence of heat. When you take away the heat, the molecules, the friction, we feel cold. But it's not that cold has something. Heat has something. Heat has the molecules that are rubbing together. So I began to think of evil as, a, as an absence of good. But I, I can't satisfy myself with that anymore because I see evil as in a sense, tangible. I see what, what Putin is doing and sending soldiers out on suicide missions, going to the prisons and saying, if you come out and fight against the Ukraine, we're gonna, you, won't, you won't go back to prison. Sure you won't go back to prison, because from here you're going to go to the cemetery. There's... I think that evil is where someone might realize that they are a miracle, but they, the computer doesn't work for them to realize that so is the next person. They, they don't appreciate that this person, who is my enemy, my neighbor, uh, different from me, uh, or far away from me, that they don't deserve what I believe I deserve. I think that probably the essence of philosophy is always the attempt to answer the question that you're asking. And I think we're in a situation where the only response we can have is not to find an answer, but to try to do one small share to reduce the amount of evil in the world. And as I grow older, I look back upon some nice things that I did for people, but I never feel that I've done enough. Um, okay, maybe maybe someone else wants also to add something. Yeah, it should be. I'm fine. Do you want us? Yeah. See, that's yeah. the question I, I you asked before. before. Yes, I have the question, question you asked before is yeah. the disparity between Israel may be the startup nation with high-tech and artificial intelligence and generic drugs, but people living in Israel have a hard time because they can't afford the restaurants and, and the apartments in Tel Aviv. No, and the, the, I think that a lot of people have a nice time too, because I live in, uh, in Jaffa. I have apartments, sometimes I live in Jaffa, you know, Jaffa, between, right. behind the Arabs. I live in Jaffa. Jaffa? Jaffa. He lives in Yaffa. He lot has of an yeah. apartment there. Lot he of has yeah. an apartment there in Yaffa. Yaffa. Yeah. I want to, 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 to answer this question. Just drive his bicycle. To live in Vilnius, bike his bicycle, forget the car. Why do I go to Yaffa? If you want to rest, you go to Yaffa. <laughs> what he's saying is what you're doing now is good. <laughs> you're not putting whatever little money you have into a nicer car. No. You're basically saying, I'm going to get along with what I have and I'll give the bus. Uh, 
what's very hard for us to do is to, when we see ourselves sacrificing, it's to figure out how we could still make our assets grow. What could I do to get over the line where I have extra funds mm -hmm. to that could start earning its money itself? Um, and that's why the dream of of so many young people is to start a, 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 a start up a company in their garage or the trunk of their car, they'll become Google. Uh, or they'll, in the black community, it's to become a basketball player. You know, it's, um, uh, it, it, it's hard. And especially as we get older, it's the, it, it seems as if we have less and less opportunity. But we actually have wisdom that, uh, of experience that young people don't have. There is something beneficial for having, facing a challenge that you're facing and coming back here that somebody who's lived here the whole time doesn't have. And maybe it's that they're saying, I'm not going to worry about the future and spending what they have. I saw in the Czech Republic, young people, you know, buying a beer for, you know, for eight euro or something like that. And I could tell that they don't have uh, lots of extra in their lives, but everybody else is doing it, so I'm going to do it. And I think that uh, we, we have experience that teaches us things that, that uh, others don't have. But it's a tough question. It's a tough question. It because has to because I, see, I see, like, when I went to Luxembourg, I was envying, I was jealous for those who were born in Luxembourg and they have their apartments given right. uh, as, a, as a gift or as a parents, they have a big one. I don't have, a, my parents, they don't live here. They live in a small village. I don't have anything in Vilnius that they will say, hey, Amantas, you're a nice guy. Here's the keys, you know? Right. They will say, yeah, here's the keys. Take it. No, I don't have that. And I just think life, give, life puts me in this place for some reasons. Yeah. I'm a bit regretting why I didn't bought apartment 10 years ago when it was a cheap, <laughs> when it was a Lithuanian currency. I'm regretting. Well, I could have thought. Yeah, but... But if people knew 10 years ago, yeah. it wouldn't have been cheap then. Everybody would have bought. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they you're would not have the bought. only one. They would have bought 10 years ago, yeah. But you're not the only one. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. Ten, you're not the only one. There's a million people who are saying, if only I had bought that apartment 10 years ago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have to be happy. Wow. You're not alone. Our you, the real thousand thing, people. <laughs> there are very wealthy people who are saying the same thing, except not for one million, but I could have bought that mansion for 25 million. Now it's 100 million. Yeah. You know? How do you deal with regrets? Or do you regret anything in your life? In, re, do, do you have any regrets in your life and how do you deal with that? Uh, good question. I have had regrets in my life, but the way I dealt with it is that I realized that if I had ever made another decision other than what I did, if I had acted differently, one thing I know for sure and one thing possible, for sure I know I would not be who I am today. Because I am a product of mistakes I made, or choices I chose, or choices I didn't choose. And I want to be me. Mm -hmm. I'd like to be me with more money, I'd like to be me with more health, but I want to be me. And if I had not made those choices, I would be different. And not necessarily better. The second thing is a possibility. I always keep in mind, that if I had decided to stay where I was, and I've lived in about four different countries already, if I had decided to stay in the one that's the best place, 
the next the next day I could have been crossing the street and gotten killed by a truck oh, yeah. <coughs> and I imagine this is fact I imagine myself getting killed and then grabbing God by the beard and saying why did you kill me it wasn't my time and God said to me all right I'm willing to turn back the clock and you won't cross the street and getting killed. Instead, move from uh, New York to Los Angeles. Are you willing to do that? Say yes. I don't want to be a dead person in New York. I want to be alive. And God says, okay, but there's one condition. You will not remember that I gave you that choice. <laughs> so here I am. Nice. <laughs> but do you get with it? Excellent. I, that's the way I think. It's true. I think that way. <laughs> How do I know what would have happened to me if I would have made the so-called right choice? I could be dead. We have to get out of here. <laughs> Let's go because we got to lock it up. Listen, I taught on on uh, Tuesday night. I gave a lecture on sex and Judaism. Mm -hmm. If you, anybody wants the uh, papers, for sure, and sex also. Nobody is interested. It's without pictures. And you can always come back and ask Jovenus. There's no pictures. Moshe, Moshe, but there's no pictures. Wow. <laughs>